Welcome everyone. I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for joining us today. This is our last Friday forum of the uh, spring 2021 series. So we're really excited to have all of you, are, all, all of you all here, here today um, and joining us and helping us end on a really great note. Um, if you've been joining us for the entirety of the series or if this is your first time, welcome. We're really excited to have you all here and hope you enjoy today's conversation. Um, so to set the scene really quickly, um, Friday Forum is a weekly lecture series that's held every semester here at the University Y, um, where we talk about different issues and trends and events happening all around the world um, and really just provide us a space to address topics um, that are of relevance and urgency in our time. Um, we've looked at a variety of things in the past, like at using art as activism, environmental justice, looking at the state of our democracy. And this semester, we're really interested um, in learning about and considering how digital media technology has really shaped and both misshaped our world. Um, many of us are using technology much more than we ever have in the last few months, in the last few years. And we've, as we continue using it, we um, are learning more about how technology is opening many doors, but also comes with many consequences that are important for us to consider. Um, and so we really just wanna provide a space um, to look into this and to address and better understand these intersections where technology um, comes into play with things like race, with class, privacy, education, faith, public health. These are just a variety of things that we've talked about just this semester alone. And there's many, many more that we could potentially talk about, I'm sure. Um, and so that's what we're really interested in looking into this semester. We've had really amazing conversations thus far um, where we've had speakers joining us who have um, talked about things like how data is used in immigration surveillance. Um, we've talked about the biases in search algorithms, about um, the intersection of Black culture and technology, about using data and technology for social good, about disrupting disinformation, and the connection between faith and technology in the light of the pandemic. Um, so those are just some of the talks that we've had this semester. Um, if you hopefully have been able to join us. And if you haven't, the recordings are all on our Facebook, um, as well as we'll be going up on our website later. So hopefully you guys can check those out if you happen to miss them. Um, but that is what we are currently doing this semester and how this um, has been played out. And so I'm really excited to end on a great note today with um, Amy, Amy Rickman, who's been joining us. Um, quickly in the chat, I'm gonna send in a list of all of our sponsors for this series. Um, and since it is also our last series, I'm also just gonna quickly read them out. Um, so we wanna send a great shout out and special shout out and thank you to Women and Gender in Global Perspectives Program, their first men and Church of Champaign-Urbana, the Center for Global Studies, Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign, School of Social Work, Center for Advanced Studies, uh, Humanities Research Institute, the McKinley Foundation, Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning, La Casa Cultural Latina, Department of Journalism, LGBT Resource Center, and the College of Fine and Applied Arts. Thank you so much for helping us make this series happen, for helping us um, continue the, the work and the legacy of Friday Forums, even as we're moving to a virtual space. Um, so thank you so much. And for all of you who have continued to join us and support us, thank you so much as well. So uh, to bring it all into today's talk, I'm really excited to have Dr. Amy Rickman with us, um, who's going to be sharing a little bit about her work and her knowledge around the social media and its impacts. Um, so long before COVID-19 forced our nation online, young people throughout the US were living their lives on and across social media. Today's talk will examine this media migration, drawing upon ethnographic research with female Midwestern teens and other youth. The speaker traces young people's social media use back on their experiences seeking guidance, advocacy, survival, and roots to, into their own words, be somebody someday in modern U.S. society. Um, there are material, re uh, material reasons for social media use, um, explaining how we do adolescence, gender, race, class, and technology. And for looking forward, our youth require critical awareness, systemic efforts, and new conceptualizations from adults to uh, be supported in their struggles on and offline. So that's 
a little synop synopsis of what you're going to be hearing today. Um, and to quickly introduce Amy herself, Amy uh, work considers youth and social technologies. So she is author of Ad Adolescence, Girlhood, and Media Migration, um, which was published in 2018. And she's an associate professor of child and family science at California State University, where she directs youth and social media research lab. Her writing has appeared in mainstream publications, including the Atlantic, Monthly Review, and Public Eye. She received her doctorate from Illinois, where she was a proud GEO member and co-founder and director of CU's Girl Zone. In 2020, she was named Fresno's Woman Educator of the Year and recipient of, the, of an Urbana Arts Grant. Um, so Amy, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to get to know some a little bit more about your work and hear the great things you're gonna talk about today. Um, for our, our attendees, as you're listening, if you have any questions throughout the talk, please use the Q&A feature and we'll have a little bit of time at the end um, to ask Amy some questions and um, have a little bit more of a discussion. So Amy, I'll go ahead and pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Griselda. I want to thank Griselda, uh, Nancy Dietrich, and the Friday Forum Committee, and all of the forum sponsors for inviting me here today. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for being here as well. I send special appreciation and welcome to my undergraduate scholars from my Youth and Social Media Research Lab who are voluntarily tuning in from California at the end of their spring break today. Um, I'm Amy Rickman, as mentioned. I'm an ethnographer who studies US youth and social technologies. As an ethnographer, I work with the same interlocutors or youth who I meet um, repeatedly over time to document and try to understand their complex meaning making processes and their complex lives. Ethnography relies on time and trust. And I find it an especially useful way to study youth and social media and other uh, highly controversial topics in our society. So uh, Champaign-Urbana was home to me in many ways uh, for many years. And for those who are not in Champaign-Urbana, this is where the Friday Forum is. Uh, my sister Jolie lived here before I came for grad school in 1993. And while living here, uh, I came to Friday Forums often. Uh, I appreciated the important spaces it created and offered, offered to the community. I'm honored to be speaking here today. And uh, I lived in Urbana for 21 years and had the privilege of working with generous geniuses uh, some of whom are listed here who shaped my lives. Um, these people, among others, um, are, uh, have made me who I am in so many ways. And I am so grateful to Champaign-Urbana. Uh, Champaign-Urbana has such a wealth of wonderful people. I have worked a jillion different jobs, stay afloat throughout grad school and played in bands, taught guitar, at course in music. And I was deeply involved in the local community. Through this, I met lifelong friends, allies, and co-conspirators. Uh, I was fortunate to be part of local girls' lives as a co-founder and director of Girl Zone. And uh, there's a book on Girl Zone that's available on the second floor of the Urbana Free Library, written by Mary Sheridan. Uh, it's available at the library now, I just checked. I, I also met my partner here. We were married at the University's Arboretum uh, with reception at the Orpheum. I was able to import two of my other sisters here for a while, and my mother moved here eight years ago. My partner and I have been living here in Urbana again since last October when we migrated back to support elderly family members amid the devastating spread of COVID this year. I know that this is the case for many of you as well, uh, but I know that this is a beautiful town uh, that cares about youth, girls, community, and justice. It's one of my favorite places on earth, and again, I'm so honored to be speaking with you today. Last year, my book came out in paperback. Uh, this starts my unofficial book tour. It was meant to start last year when the paperback that was more affordable came out, but COVID uh, put some, uh, some blockages in many different plans. But again, it's available at the Urbana Free Library. I just checked it is available. And also my publisher, Lexington Books, which is part of Roman and Littlefield, uh, has offered a 30% discount code on the book. And uh, I think Griselda said she will be dropping that in chat if anyone's interested. But again, it's available in the library, which is so important. Uh, but I'm honored to be here today. This is an immensely challenging time for so many of us as we do what we can to support the most vulnerable among us through this pandemic. With more than half a million COVID deaths to date in the US, I wanna start by acknowledging the pain felt throughout our nation and our world and the disproportionate impact this pandemic has had on brown, black, indigenous, and poor communities. I appreciate the Friday Forum for taking responsible steps to protect public health by hosting this talk virtually. I also wanna take a minute to recognize the injustices, the injustices underway in our nation, resulting from the continuation of historical systemic inequity and violence of predatory colonial capitalism, Black Lives Matter, white nationalism is gaslighting, people deserve protection and rights over individual profit motives, and. Youth deserve better. 
So historical perspective is essential to study youth. Uh, there's We can't study youth without looking at history, but also no credible work on youth can be disconnected from the moment. So we need to be present with our realities and with the realities that youth face right now, if we hope to understand those deemed young and not yet full citizens. Uh, I wanna issue a trigger warner, warning before proceeding. This talk will speak of violence and abuse, uh, which is also unfortunately necessary in speaking about youth. So to start, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes and imagine a youth in the US. Uh, imagine a teen, a millennial, an adolescent, a young person. I want you to imagine a youth. So just think about a youth in the US. The social imaginary is part of what I study. I want you to think about what you imagined. How did you get that image or these images that are in your head? How were they shaped by firsthand experience? How might they uh, be perhaps also shaped by other forces, including media and uh, repeated pattern messages of who people are, who we might not encounter too often, that uh, can even override our own direct knowledge? Um, if I paired you up with someone else in the room to talk about your image, what would you have explained as your image? Uh, are there certain ideas of youth that seem easier to share and more likely to lead to an easy conversation with a stranger? Think about it. How do we collectively think about youth in this country? How do we in this country collectively think about youth? How does this shape how they think about themselves? How does this shape how they see themselves and who they are? Uh, how, how, what somebody is, is very much shaped by how we see them. As a social cultural feminist and critical race scholar, I ask how social technologies are involved in social cognition about youth in our country. And I also uh, ask others to see adolescence, youth, cognition, and power as social technologies. So let's think about a youth in the US. Uh, in 2016, US teen Hazel Juco uh, posted a Twitter photo showing yellow water running out of her high school bathroom spot faucet. The 17 year old's picture captioned dryly, uh, referenced one of her many ascribed identities as a non-white female minor. She wrote, what a great day to be a rocket. The Washington Post newspaper reported that Juco posted the picture hoping that someone would see it and help because in her words, uh, our school doesn't have money. Instead of addressing the problem, the high school called Juco in and suspended her for using a phone in the school's bathroom. Only after offline objections were raised by parents, community members, and classmates was the suspension lifted by the local superintendent. Only after this was the school ordered to fix the water. More than a decade ago, Lisa Nakamura, uh, the brilliant Lisa Nakamura, wrote on how the internet was launched with promises of incorporeal equality, freedom from the pesky bodily shackles of gender, race, class, ability, as in this early MCI commercial. Uh, Dr. Nakamura writes on how these were empty promises. Joining Sophia Noble, uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, and so many other luminaries stressing that online spaces exist as a product of society, not somehow outside of society. As such, these spaces not only replicate offline inequities, but they normalize and affirm dominant hierarchies by claiming a false guise of technological disembodied objectivity. Technology is a product of people, of policies, of practices. We should not be trusting technology more than we trust people. So social media are no longer expected to live up to proponents early emancipatory utopian promises uh, by many, but echoes of this MCI commercial and John Perry Barlow continue to ring out in commercial and academic realms where tech sales are soaring. And girls and other members of marginal communities who lack traditional or, or any routes to justice continue to place their hopes in the power of social media. Why? Uh, thinking back to the days before COVID, the days before we were all media migrating, many wondered why US youth spent so much time online. Uh, I did. We have numerous dominant discourses explaining this. Some, uh, these are deeply held in our society and, and generally believed. Uh, some believe that youth are somehow more innately digital and digitally able than older folks. Uh, some of these discourses say that youth are somehow pathologically peer crazy and uniquely and biologically programmed to be social, driving them online. This discourse is particularly uh, uh, applied to young women. And we see it a lot with girls and young women, this, this discourse about 
being a social addict. Um, so somehow biologically in us, in, in young people to be online. And uh, lastly, uh, girls are often, youth are viewed as going wild by being online, particularly girls. We, in our society, we have many ways that this is considered. It's deeply seated within uh, some of our, our most esteemed institutions of religion, psychology, uh, G. Stanley Hall here, uh, had particular visions of, of adolescents and girls uh, that shape sexism as we have it in society now. Um, uh, different religious uh, institutions have beliefs about girls being driven by hormones in ways that make them wild. It's just disputed by the research. Um, and in this case, Dr. James Dobson, this was something shown to me by my advisor, Reed Larson, while I was studying here at Illinois. Uh, he said uh, some kids are not entirely rational, just as severely menopausal women may accuse her innocent and bewildered husband of infidelity. A hormonally depressed teenager may not interpret his world accurately either. His social judgment is impaired. Here we see a his, um, but we also see a linkage to to a woman, to hormonal craziness, to being out of out of our ability to help, to being out of control. Uh, somehow biologically. And we have many ways that this is shown and passed on through society in mainstream uh, venues. And uh, here, an uh, article in, this, in the Sacramento Bee talked about how two young women uh, spiked their parents' milkshakes in, because they weren't allowed to use the internet in, in a very pulp fiction form. The Sacramento Bee wrote, the girls wanted to use the internet and they'd go to whatever means they had to. So um, these are beliefs that we have about youth uh, and about why they're online. And uh, they actually they haven't been vetted. Uh, they, they are, research just doesn't back any of these views. We're, we're all social. So youth are not any uh, more social than we are, but when people are deprived of the ability to be social, often they'll be more interested in, soci in sociality. Just like if you were deprived of cookies and you loved them and you uh, felt like you needed them. Uh, Esther Hargitay is among the many scholars who finds that digital abilities vary widely within all age groups uh, and that youth are more accurately considered uh, and called digital naives rather than digital natives. And the gone wild narrative quietly affirms cultural patriarchy and highly gendered expectations around domesticity. They help to further deny girls and women's realities. A quote in a report from 2010 alluding to this discourse is what initially inspired my own research uh, and my dissertation and my book and my continued research. And so I write on this a lot in my book. Uh, instead, uh, I, so my research looked at uh, young people and why they were online. And it found that instead of these what I found from talking to youth about their lives is that uh, their online involvement is best conceptualized as a form of migration, of people desperately trying to do what's needed to gain a better life, to gain a chance of survival, to, 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 to take care of themselves and those they care for. So we'll come back to this. Uh, but I'm an ethnographer who studies US youth culture and social technologies to do so. I work with those considered adolescents in the rural US an overlooked region uh, in, when it comes to research. I spent 12 months in the field with a group of racially and ethnically diverse rural Midwestern teenage young women for my first round of field work from which my book is written. And I'm currently writing my next book based on more recent ethnographic work with gender minorities throughout California's Central Valley. And uh, these are both interesting places in many ways. Chicago is perhaps the main place thought of in the US Midwest, but this is only a small sliver of life uh, in, in the Midwest region. The Midwest is also a place of severe austerity, uh, which led to massive cuts following the 2008 economic collapse, as documented from this article, uh, like a tornado right-wing ideologues have swept through state houses across the Midwest, leaving devastation in their wake. Uh, in order to implement their austerity agenda, they work to create crisis and chaos. Uh, and so this is, uh, the Midwest is deeply racked by austerity in ways that have shut down many essential social services and supports for youth, their families, those they love, those who are in their community, their schools. And indeed the heartland, uh, which the Midwest is considered, faces the highest level of intergenerational downward mobility in the nation. My research focuses on rural areas of the Midwest, where there's migration from urban regions and extensive immigration, leading to a much more racially, ethnically, economically diverse population than typically imagined of these flyover states, as they disparagingly call them. 
But this is the Rust Belt in many parts where with many closed manufacturing plants, deep and long poverty and um, many dismantled social safety structures, which are needed for communities to exist, for, for areas to exist. They are, they are necessary. Uh, the Central Valley is uh, also uh, very different than what people think about when they think about California. So Central Valley is in this part of California. And when people think of California, the ideas that they have uh, are, are plentiful. But many of these ideas are not the realities of the Central Valley, where income, educational opportunities, and even life expectancy are quite unlike what people imagine when they think of LA, San Francisco, San Diego, Big Sur. Um, the Central Valley is one of the world's most productive agricultural regions, giving it the nickname of the breadbasket. And uh, we, see, we see many, um, uh, many different parts of life uh, that are similar to, to the Midwest in the Central Valley. We see lots of um, economic diversity. We see lots of ethnic diversity. But less than 1% of the total farmland in the U.S. is in the Central Valley, but it pr produces nearly 10% of the nation's agricultural output. Um, but this is also an area of high poverty and environmental degradation, with many environmental pollutants uh, being sent from the coast and, and pooling over this poor, poorer area. And in the it has the nation's worth, worst air quality. The San Joaquin Valley is uh, part of the Central Valley, and uh, this is where it is. So uh, this is the work that I do. I do uh, ethnography of highly diverse groups of young people asking why they're online, and in doing so, considering their lives on and offline. Through this eth ethnographic work, I discovered that my young interlocutors are online because they were trying to hustle and do what they could to get around offline obstacles that prevented them from getting information and guidance they needed to make informed choices about their lives, their body, their safety, their futures. Uh, media migration was taken to try to find this information that they knew they needed to advance themselves. Um, media migration was done in attempts to feel meaningful when offline opportunities packed them into overcrowded rooms and uh, did less than that. Media migration was also taken to um, try to get around obstacles that stood in the way of these young people having the control that they needed and they felt they needed to improve their lives and the lives of those they loved and of, of those in their community. All of the young people, all of my interlocutors, uh, all the young people in my study wanted to help them, both themselves and others. They all wanted to give back to their communities. They wanted to find ways to make the world better, but they were at, at a loss of how to do so. So uh, these faced many forms of injustice that they felt unable to address and unsupported in addressing. They faced misogyny, racism, heteroprivilege, and poverty, which served as push forces in what uh, I term media migration, promises of freedom, connection, popularity, uh, limitlessness, and guidance uh, from online sources served as pull factors, uh, and promises of uh, and the ability to feel seen and heard and respected in ways that it's very hard offline. The teens I work with experienced very high levels of uncertainty as they tried to figure out how to move towards a future with social relevance and full rights. Further complicating matters was that their inability to ineffectively negotiate the marginality they faced in their life offline with adults uh, was, was trenchant. They felt that no matter what they did, they were unable to gain respect. They were unable to gain standing offline. They were unable to help themselves and those they loved, and they very much wanted to. So combined, these factors led them into uh, what I consider media migration, which is how I think we should think about young people online. So um, the young people I studied tried to self-advocate in many ways, but they found few offline supports and many intractable constraints. Because of this, they regularly made calculated decisions to take place in media migration, where in perhaps the most American of acts, they move their efforts to and through online sp social spaces, different social media platforms, fleeing harsh conditions and trying to catch a break that might grant them more supportive environments and opportunities driven by the desire to, in their own words, be somebody someday. So I found in my research that this is why they were online. So again, imagine a youth and let me tell you about another. On October 26, 2015 in Columbia, South Carolina, the 18 year old African-American Spring Valley High School senior, Naya Kenny sat in math class as her classmate Shakara was ordered by her teacher to go to the principal's office 
after breaking a class cell phone use rule. Shakara stayed at her desk. An administrator and school resource officer, uh, Deputy Benfield, known to students as Officer Slam, were called into the classroom. Naya Kelly said she prepared for the worst when she saw the officer. When he came into the classroom, she said, I immediately told my, my classmates, get your phones out, get your phones out. I think this is going to go downhill, and it did. Deputy Philip Fields asked Shakara whether she would come with him or if he was going to, quote, going to have to make her. After she refused again to leave, he put his arm around Shakara's neck to pull her up. He flipped the desk backwards, pulled the teen out of her chair and threw her across the room. Shakara was handcuffed and taken out of the room. The teacher and an assistant principal stood by during all this. Naya Kelly reported that she was stunned when this began, but she knew it was an injustice and filmed it all on her phone as it happened while screaming and crying and calling on others to do so as well in protest of the assault. Uh, Kenny later said she was just standing up for her classmate who she barely knew. I didn't even know her name, Kenny said. She was a quiet girl, but the fact that she was being thrown like that, I would have stood up like that for a boy or a girl, she said. She didn't do anything at all to deserve it. I was the only one who was really vocal about the situation, the only one. Two other grown men were in, a, in the class and I was the only one who was vocal, protesting the situation. But in attempting to stand up against this clear and condoned injustice against a young black woman, she was the one who received backlash. After taking Shakara away, Deputy Field came back to the room and went straight to Naya asking, do you want some too? Naya Kenny um, was arrested and charged with disturbing school, the same charge given to Shakara. She was held for eight and a half hours in the detention center where she ultimately um, was released. Uh, later, uh, she dropped out of school. The experience led Naya to drop out of school just months before her graduation. She ultimately earned her GED, um, but uh, yes, this this was uh, this is a very impactful situation. Deputy Fields was fired, but he's suing for discrimination. All charges were dropped against him, including an inquiry by the U.S. Department of Justice into whether Shakara's civil rights had been violated. It doesn't have to be like this, Naya said. Kids, let alone kids in school, should not be abused. Uh, adults should not be abusing kids, and adults should certainly be standing up for kids when they face abuse. But as Naya knew from this incident, this is often not the case as adults who are charged with injustice commonly retaliate against those calling them out. Barring other forms of protection, Naya felt her only option for dignity, rights, and basic safety was through collecting evidence of the incident through her cell phone and sharing it with others who might care. Naya Kenny's example is illustrative of what I've been finding in my own work with young people. The Southern region of California Central Valley is the, again, the San Joaquin Valley, um, uh, mainly rural area of the US with very high poverty rates, unemployment, pollution, and incarceration. The town of Stockton uh, as mentioned with the air pollution and in this report is in the San Joaquin Valley. It boasts a school arrest rate of children that's more than 35% higher than the state average. Uh, the ACLU states this type of adolescent behavior should never be met with arrest. A criminal charge in school dramatically reduces a student's likelihood of graduating and steers them towards, quote, ongoing involvement with the criminal justice system. In other words, lack of justice for youth at this stage of life forces them to encounter further injustice throughout their lives. To give you a sense of the area, Stockton is here uh, in part of the Central Valley. Again. Uh, imagine a youth in the US. In 2018, inspired by the female high schoolers from the rural US Midwest, I studied from my book, Adolescent Girlhood and Media Migration. I coordinated a listening tour through the Localization Allies Project that brought adult community leaders together to listen to youth in formal and informal spaces of learning, some of which were in this town in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, six years earlier, in interviews held mostly in cars, in my car on walks and sitting in ditches along the road uh, with youth due to a lack of public meeting spaces, teens in the rural Midwest told me throughout my field work that they felt isolated and distressed. They had frustrations in their lives, but as I write in my book, outside of popularity, they could not figure out how to effectively self-advocate and fight back against the trivialization, confusion, and powerlessness they often felt in trying to, and again, their words, be somebody someday. They also felt helpless against the oppression they experienced when they and others confronted sexism, white supremacy, and other normalized cultural injustices in their lives. They tried to negotiate these things, but to no avail. For example, Latoya, uh, interlocutor in my research, 
lived more than a thousand miles from the Florida town where Trayvon Martin, an un unarmed black teen, was fatally shot by George Zimmerman. She was outraged by the killing and by Zimmerman's ability to walk away with impunity, but she was left alone in her apt interpretation of justice as part of a community that criminalized Martin and voiced support of the killer through both words and silence. As I write in my book, Latoya explain, my teacher said they're gonna have a trial on April 10th. And I think that's when they're gonna decide if Zimmerman's going to jail and I hope he does. And if I could be at the trial when they have it, I would be there, but I can't. I mean, I don't think my mom is gonna let me, but I would go and I would sit there in the back and I would probably have some comments because if it was a black person who shot a Caucasian, Latoya said, we would go to jail, 25 years to life, no bond, no bail, but it's different. I just think that everyone should have the same equal rights, like equal justice laws. There really should be a law. And if I was old enough to go up and say, this needs to be a law, this should be a law and propose it, I would, but I'm not old enough, so I can't. From my year long field work with Latoya and other teens, I learned that these frustrations were primary motivators that pushed them to and through social media platforms and what they helped me to understand and coin is media migration. The non-rural and mixed gendered group, groups of youth we met and the localization allies listening to us shared these feelings of frustration. Uh, teens told us that they felt cut off from meaningful involvement in the world they all wished to contribute to. They felt disconnected from issues that impacted them directly. Some of the youth were core organizers in their schools and their communities, but even they did not know how to work towards changing deep injustices they regularly saw and experienced offline in the US. The truth is, none of us do. Last summer, as COVID raged our nation, I thought a lot about this. I wondered then, outside of quarantining the nation, how do we stop school and neighborhood shootings and advocate for our children when the NRA pays politicians to support them in profiting by any means. As we reel from the lynchings of Richard Brooks, David Medigy, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and so many other, far too many other black Americans killed while privileged white people are protected. How do we address and end the dehumanization and violence faced by black people who are regularly abused and killed with impunity in all corners of the USA, a country which as Reverend Jesse Jackson stated 15 years ago has quote, an amazing tolerance for black pain. I also wondered um, after learning from a 2018 FOIA request the presidential rebuke last uh, in 2008 led to fake audience members being digitally added to official crowd photos in an official photo of the 2017 DC Women's March. Oh, so sorry, uh, digitally added. So fake audience members were added to the 2016 presidential inauguration. Uh, and in January, 2020, um, we learned that signs held by protesters in an official photo of the 2017 DC Women's March were altered and removed by the national archives, our nation's archives. Um, after learning this, I had to wonder, how do we keep our country's history from being erased and rewritten by those who seek to, discommon, to discredit common people and their movements that keep, um, that work in many ways to subordinate people and to profit off of that? Following the past administration's lies, dismissal of COVID-19 as a hoax, and continued neglectful suppression of critical research, um, that last summer I wrote that the death was topping 100,000 while uh, the administration was maintaining divisive traditions of disinformation, cronyism, corporate welfare, bullying, corporate capture, an appointment of protection um, and protected agency leaders invested in uh, dismantling the protections. How do we trust that we will be cared for, well-informed and safe in our nation in times both of calm and of na natural disaster? How? Uh, with our nation's coronavirus response led by Vice President Mike Pence last year, last summer, I was one, I was, I had to just puzzle over um, how this would work out well. Mike, our Vice President was a politician who crafted federal privatization efforts in a Coke funded space that gutted rather than restored New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and who as governor ignored public health experts advices uh, and advice to, to help people leading to a statewide HIV infection rate which uh, was found to be on par with the world's most HIV infected countries in Indiana in 2015. 
uh, with that being the case, how do we know what we need to know to effectively look out for ourselves and for one another as COVID-19 was spreading? And this was who was in charge of keeping us safe. And as we have become increasingly dependent upon our screens and our mass media migration, how have we been positioned to value profit-driven tycoons who collude to take away our rights? And who, how have we been led to trust these tycoons and profiteers more than our own children, more than teachers and others who have spent decades supporting our youth and our community? For the past four years, I've been writing a new book based on my ethnographic work with poor gender minority young people throughout California Central Valley. Most are people of color. I followed their media migrations from offline injustices to online spaces where they found community, information, self-soothing, opportunities to warn others and people who would acknowledge their pleas for affirmation and help. Costs were paid for this in many ways as I talk about in my book and as I will talk about in my next, next book. Uh, for example, uh, these young people's attention was found to be focused even more on popularity, spectacle, and normalized non-consent uh, that they were already taught to accept within capitalism, within their larger um, dominant system. And this is, this is one of the safety areas that I think is much overlooked when we look at young people and safety, how their attention is directed to popularity and how that feeds them into uh, coercive systems. Um, but what matters here right now is that these youth had been motivated to use social media for years, due in large part to the normalized neglect, abuse, and gaslighting they experienced and grew to expect offline. And they all use social media to try to get around intractable arbiters of justice that they learned would neither defend nor protect them in their daily lives. Take Luna, who persisted through years of regular teacher condoned teasing from male classmates because she was a female in her computer science high school classes before dropping out her senior year. Or Carla and separately Jerry, a first generation college students who gave up on talking with administrators who would explain that protesters on campus who called one of them whore and both of them hellbound um, as they walked to class, were that these protesters were protected by more rights on campus than they were. Kimberly was raped and told by her family that it did not happen and not to discuss it. Dan's Mormon parents refused to accept his gender identity. Quote, they see Dan as kidnapping their daughter, he explained to me. Robin's boss told her that those who control the budget will not listen to a young staffer, so she rarely gets credit for her work. She has dated her live-in girlfriend for more than a year, whose parents, she says, are, quote, like family, but have not been told that she's a lesbian, quote, out of respect. Jerry fears for their life daily as a gender non-binary youth. Some of these young people had jobs and side jobs and side side jobs, but others spent time handing in applications and trying to make sense of what came next. An interview for a part-time job at a fast food chain expected one to have knowledge of the company's founder for minimum wage. Another was called into three first interviews with the same minimum wage job over the past 10 weeks and still had no offer. Those who were in school worried about whether financial aid would continue, and if so, if it would again arrive at this after the start of the semester, late, forcing them to begin an, another year behind on reading and with more late bills, um, late fees from bills. They worried about transportation costs, their undocumented parents and family, accessing food, avoiding further debt, being unhoused again. Despite the odds, they all earnestly wanted to contribute more to their wider society. They had dreams one day of becoming teachers, nurses, therapists, social workers, doctors, children's books, authors, employed, respected. I know these stories and many others. I wish more people did. These young people are strong, talented, and hopeful, but they are also vulnerable and made more so by our, by our culture and country's inequality, injustice, and denigration of vulnerability that forced them to have to fight for themselves against oppression that we all experience. These experiences um, that they face challenge, uh, cause them challenge in life and great difficulty, finding allies and advocates though they seek help. Some adults, they said, did not want to help them due to disbelief or fear for their own social standings. Adults were often overloaded with no time to get involved. Uh, understandably, if, after many are still reeling, uh, all except the top percent are still reeling after the last economic recession. In many cases, adults didn't want to even hear about the realities youth were facing leading to challenge. Hardship faced being singled out and disparaged for who they are is denied. 
gender did not, uh, youth told me, and I learned from them that gender identity is denied, rape is denied, struggle is denied, reframed as an issue of character rather than involvement within structure. Poverty is denied, systemic racism is denied, female sexuality is shamed and denied, patriarchy is denied, misogyny is denied, white supremacy is denied, inequity in our society is denied. The youth I work with know that many adults with power simply don't wanna hear these things. They left these young people alone to deal with their realities, socially distanced long before COVID-19 hit California in March, 2020. Young people, particularly young women of color have been at the forefront of our country's most important social movements, Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, Dreamers, Sunshine Movement, SOA Watch, Occupy, Teachers Union efforts, gun control efforts, immigrant and worker right efforts farm worker efforts, climate change efforts, anti-war colonization and militarization movements, um, unionizing behemoths like Amazon, which is happening right now, despite the odds uh, and as the most, the and we'll talk about this in a bit, but young women like Autumn Peltier, Alicia Garza, Emma Gonzalez, Patrice Cullors, um, Varshni Prakash, Greta Thunberg, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and so many others have spoken truth to power in standing up against injustices and fighting for people over profit, moving us away from fear and hate and towards greater rights and justice for all. These young people are mighty and powerful, so much so that we like to say that they have it covered, that young people are going to be the change that we need to see in the world. But the reality is that many of them aren't even old enough to vote. Beyond this, they can't do it alone, especially as we, as a nation, are subtly nudged to see them as lesser by hierarchical systems operating on and offline, especially as we strap them with unprecedented school debt accrued in attempting to simply try to be part of society, as austerity hoards tax dollars away from social supports needed by them and their families, as we regulate female bodies and deregulate those who mine our world uh, and us for profit as we dismantle unions and job security and bail out the powerful, as we somehow see the statement Black Lives Matter as more controversial than the unjust criminalization and routine brutal police killing of unarmed Black people in this country. We need to have young people's backs. They need adults to stand with them together against injustices they most directly face in our society, even as we too are clobbered by the same terrorizing systemic forces of robber baron privatization, and white nationalist dis disinvestment that bleed families, workers, communities, and youth serving institutions in the US and normalize uh, in the US and beyond, and that normalize the routine killing of Black, poor, immigrant, trans, sex worker, and other marginalized people in this country. For example, they need us to see that stand your ground laws, which allowed a white man to be deemed innocent after killing Trayvon Martin were formed by powerful corporations and legislators gathered together with the NRA in the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which is a covert Koch funded group, COCH, uh, -C Koch uh, family, uh, which is also behind racist voter suppression laws, behind the 2017 federal tax cut, behind bills criminalizing indigenous Standing Rock protesters and others protecting nature from entitled oil pipelines and violence. Uh, this is a group behind anti-choice and anti-Palestine movements, among much else. ALEC leads efforts to bankrupt workers and unions, and they partner with a group that cause, calls for the sterilization of trans people on, quote, campus free speech bills, empowering hate speech. They have pushed legislation, deregulating and nurturing the wealthy for decades, while eroding supports for average Americans. ALEC was a driving force behind last spring's charge to quote, reopen the American economy, more aptly called sacrificing, sacrificing poor people to a plague, particularly black, indigenous, female, and otherwise marginalized people. Many of their members are deeply, many members of ALEC are deeply invested in the austerity that privatize and bleed public universities. Before ballooning uh, two thirds to over to around $190 billion this February, Amazon owner Jeff Bezos increased his wealth by $25 billion in the first four months of 2020. During the same time, Bezos' fortune grew, workers at more than 50 of his Amazon warehouses contracted coronavirus, and he fired two black employees, two young black employees who were forced to organize to gain basic protective gear and sick leave needed to persist within the pandemic. 
Federal law outlaws termination of employees for collectively organizing to address their working conditions. Instead, though, after plotting to defame him, Amazon justified the firing of warehouse worker Chris Smalls in New York as a result of, quote, violating social distancing guidelines and putting the safety of others at risk. They explain the firing of Bashir Mohammed in Minneapolis as the result of, quote, violating social distance guidelines. This continues a pattern that Amazon ex uh, uh, or uh, that Amazon established before the coronavirus outbreak in firing workers involved in collective organizing to attempt to address working conditions uh, and terming it safety violations. A fellow worker at the Minneapolis warehouse where Bashir Mohammed worked explained what Amazon workers continue to face on the job. They said, when we speak up, we receive what, Bash what Bashir received. Amazon is not focusing on how to protect the community from this coronavirus spreading. They focus on how to shut us up. In April of last year, Bezos fired two additional workers, this time young female engineers who spoke out in support of these and other warehouse workers. This public critique of the company's labor practices was framed as, quote, repeatedly violating internal policies. One of the engineers, Maren Kosts, said she does not regret the action she took in support of her coworkers after 15 years of employment at Amazon. This is about human lives and the future of humanity, she said. In this crisis, we must stand up for what we believe in have hope and demand from our corporations and employers a decent, a basic decency that's been lacking in this crisis. Uh, and this week, The Intercept reported that the National Labor Relations Board found that Amazon retaliated against employees in Chicago for striking last year. This past week, Amazon workers attempting to unionize in Bessemer, Alabama, were hit with an onslaught of anti-union testimonials from Twitter accounts shared on Facebook accounts, which were pretending to be Amazon workers. Stock photos were used for many of them, uh, like Bert at OK4 was a stock photo that they found traced back to uh, this shared public image. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, and many of the images were females, uh, uh, Black people, Indigenous people, people of color. A wider profit driven PR effort was and is underway, and it works on behalf of powerful and well moneyed anti union efforts uh, that seek to gain funds to take away common people's rights. Fake accounts are part of public relations, a long time part of public relations. Uh, they're meant to create the idea of popularity, uh, to advance agendas. We've seen this many times before. In 2016, fake Twitter accounts appropriated black identities to rally for the Trump, Trump campaign. These are fake accounts using black faces, blackface, to try to say they stand with this idea, ideological, Blackface. Last year, similar fake accounts were used to deny COVID. And uh, this is Corey Akers, a fake account. Uh, uh, Brandy Collins Dexter of Color of Change told NBC that the past decade is filled with coordinated propaganda efforts to appropriate and use the identities of African Americans and other marginalized people to delegitimate liberation efforts and to, uh, to, to delegitimate efforts attempting to keep Black people safe. The truth is the opposite of this, she says, and others. Last April, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg posted a statement committed and committing his company to fighting disinformation on his platform. Journalist Alan Sankin found that advertisers were allowed to pay to place ads on Facebook and Instagram, specifically targeting the sites, identifying as having interest in the category of pseudoscience. Um, feeding the dissemination of scientific disinformation and distrust to 78 million users. And uh, around the time that Zuckerberg said this, uh, uh, Sankin found that this happened after Zuckerberg made this statement. But uh, earlier in April, a consumer reports reporter posted as the Self-Preservation Society and attempted to run seven Facebook ads with overt misinformation about the coronavirus, including those that stated that young people under 30 were safe to ignore social distancing and advising virus prevention through small daily doses of bleach. These were fake, but all were accepted by Facebook. Again, these are fake, 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 fake. So the Guardian found more uh, than 75% uh, of Twitter accounts pushing for murderously negligent reopening during the pandemic last summer to be fake accounts. This is the feigning of populism, the weaponization of popularity pushed by capitalism and advanced within media migration. It is not technology alone that's doing this. It's part of a larger system of profit over people. Uh, that, and this system relies on our attention uh, to give us misinformation, disinformation, which stokes confusion and division. 
Uh, misinformation, disinformation affirms dominant stereotypes, making already marginalized people look bad. As Edward Bernays knew, who is the father of public relations and the uncle of Sigmund Freud, some don't know that. Um, uh, it is uh, pub uh, public relations and misinformation is a reliable part of what businesses do. Um, disinformation is a reliable part of the PR playbook, and it's used to defend the powerful. And um, there's many different ways to pass on misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. Again, this is not new. Bernays Public Relations, uh, uh, which he coined, it was started as propaganda. He changed it to public relations. Uh, but it was, it was started to, uh, as psyops with wars to, to get people in countries to welcome a war, to support the war effort. And this was Bernays' work before he brought it to corporations. And so uh, Bernays' public relations work uh, works to defend the powerful, to protect profit over people, to use psyops uh, to both win figuratively and very literal wars within predatory capitalism. It relies on our attention donated in media migration. So for example, this is, an exa this is a photo of high school shooting survivor, Emma Gonzalez, tearing up the constitution that went viral on Twitter a couple of years ago is fake. The real photo shows her tearing up a target, uh, a target uh, practice photo. And I've been sharing this photo for far too long, uh, this heartbreaking image from Ferguson, um, Yes, so uh, this is a man who is protesting after the, the killing of Michael Brown, an uh, unarmed uh, innocent black man who uh, was killed. And he carried the sign, uh, no mom should fear for her son's life every time he leaves home. Uh, after the verdict came out, this picture reemerged like this. So again, this second photo is fake. This is fake. This was doctored to help to create ideas in our mind about who Black people are, who protesters are, who young people are. So fake. Color and Change says that um, social media enables networked harassment and unchecked disinformation, which is part of a wider system. It's not doing it alone. We need to look at these wider systems, politics, policy, economics. So again, imagine a youth. Young people need adults' trust, awareness, and outrage within capitalistic power structures that use the con of systemic racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, xenophobia, transphobia to further divide and dehumanize us. Youth deserve our very active solidarity now as we continue to be nudged to channel our feelings of loss, blame, and fear onto young people and away from violent systems that profit from our struggles and from our division amid one another. Youth deserve just systems that invest in their lives and well being. They need us and we need them. They are being denied these things. We are being denied these things. In California's Central Valley, water causes people cancer. The air quality is the worst in the nation. We are ravaged by the literal pollution of progress and gentrification allowed to pour out, out of Los Angeles, out of San Francisco, and onto us, the poorest people in the state. In one of the more tangible examples of how exorbitant wealth sustains itself here by shedding damage and risk onto those less privileged as it is shielded from having to even witness these costs. Added to this particular matter from almond trees sold to farmers through their promise to mobilize more profit by requiring few workers, make it impossible to see the mountains 60 miles to the east on most days. Local children here are three times more likely to suffer from asthma than the rest of the nation. University education that used to be free and looked to by countries around the globe as a model of social support and mobility, which my parents benefited from, which I benefit from as a result. Uh, these same systems now force students into decades of debt with predatory interest in public institutions that have not had operations fully funded for a full generation despite tax hikes. This in the land of Devin Nunez, where Oklahomans fled during the Dust Bowl, where 37 languages are spoken. Uh, which is indigenous land. In the US, we are not kept safe by those entrusted with our well being. Our youth know this. They are trying to get us to believe them and back them. They need us to believe them and back them. They need us to not only see them, but stand with them. They need us to stand with them in policy, in action, in word. They need us to stand with them in imagination and in all that we create together 
that follows from this. Imagination is essential. We need to change our understandings of youth. So please imagine a youth in the US. It doesn't have to be like this. Thank you for all you do and for all you will do. Amazing. Thank you so much, Amy. That was um, such an important conversation. I think so many instances that you brought to our attention that I think really just, I know hit home a lot for me and I'm sure it did for a lot of people. Um, I wanna go ahead and just uh, jump right into the Q&A so we have enough time. Um, so first question we have from Elizabeth, given what you learned from youth, um, what advice from them do you have for adults who want to support them? I think you kind of hit on this at towards the end, but um, I know we have a few questions about some of those more kind of tangible ways that we could support youth um, currently. Thank you so much. And thank you to Elizabeth for the question. Um, and I hope people continue talking about this well after this conversation ends. But my research finds that we need offline spaces. I study on youth online, but over and over, I come back to the reality that we need to come together in community, in things like this, the Friday Forum, in places that support us in coming together, knowing each other, having tough conversations, sharing space, sharing Thai food, uh, bag lunches, and, and getting to know one another rather than letting our understandings of one another be replaced by images that are given to us. We also, beyond that, need to realize that it's not just, uh, the youth are not the problem. We need policies, we need practices, we need to stop deregulating those entitled systems that seek to profit off of us and, and that also seek to regulate those who are uh, marginalized. So we, we need tough conversations, we need legislation, we need people to stand with youth in all that we are as a country and come together to support them and have let them support us because they want to. Uh, we have another question from Cynthia. How difficult is it to advocate for youth's rights in school campuses when many court cases, even the Supreme Court, have given more rights to the schools than the youth they hurt? Yeah, thank you to Cynthia. It was a great question. And we need much more conversation around this. There's a lot of lip service and silence around historical impression, uh, uh, oppression. We have silences because oppression exists um, within our society where if people speak out against injustice, they're often considered the problem. We need to see the shame falling on those who maintain inequity. The shame should fall on those who see the problem as the problem, uh, the, the, who, see, who see those who speak out as a problem. So right now, we very much make it hard to address injustice. So we need more solidarity. We need more collective um, consciousness raising. We need to speak across our experience. Uh, Mills speaks about sociological imagination. There's a lot of effort in our society to have people see their, their struggles as individual rather than socially shared. We need the programs that are being dismantled in the liberal arts, in women's studies, in uh, ethnic studies, in sociology to be not only retained but strengthened in our society. We need, to, we need people to call for that at the high school level, the college level. We need uh, yes, we, we need much more work on this. So Cynthia, thank you for raising this. Uh, we need more people going to city, uh, city council meetings, school board meetings, but also realizing that they're part of a larger system. So often the school would be blamed and we need to look at the larger policies and the larger institutions behind our normalization of profit over, uh, over people in our society. Um, we have a question from Karen. Um, you were studying rural minority non-binary teen females. Do you think that the findings you found are true of urban females as well, um, specifically that they go online to information to help themselves, the ones they love in their communities to improve their lives, that offline adults gaslight the teens, deny rape, deny poverty, deny injustices? Thanks for that question. So I do ethnography, which means that I'm not calling for my, my findings to be extrapolated to the whole society. A, a lot of research does call for that. But what I do is, is study a small group intensely to understand their complex realities, their lived realities. And from that, raise questions of whether this might be happening in other communities. And then studies could happen on that. Um, there's a lot of things that aren't talked about when it comes to rural communities. Rural communities, rural youth are very overlooked. Most of our studies on youth focus on uh, urban areas and areas around universities and uh, rural communities are the majority of life in the US. So, so I, I, I don't say it's extrapolatable, but I say, uh, please join me in doing more study. 
Awesome. And here we have our last question from David, um, who says, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how on somehow reaching the shockingly large proportion of people who support this incredibly oppressive status quo and so readily accepted um, the many lies fed to them. So many I've dealt with seem completely resistant to accepting or even acknowledging even the most obvious of facts. Shockingly to me, I don't know how to even spark the most basic of empathy in so many. Um, so do you have any advice and thoughts on how to do that? Such an important question. Um, as we are all media migrating right now, we're all online. Uh, part of what's happening here, in the words of Prince that I always, who I love, uh, who said, dearly beloved, we're gathered here today uh, to get through this thing called life. That's why we're online. We are online right now because we are in a deadly pandemic to try to get through life. But young people, even before the pandemic, were doing that too. They were trying to figure out ways to survive and seeking anything. They wanted it in their communities. It will, if it wasn't in their communities, they were going to try to find it through media migration. So we need far more opportunities to talk face to face. We will never get through this socially distanced. We need to log off. We need to realize that a lot of the images and identities being presented to us online are presented by well moneyed uh, in, uh, efforts that have interest in having us shape our opinions about one another about having us think about our neighbors in a certain way, but at, uh, having us think about youth in a certain way that, that doesn't, it, it doesn't care anything about youth or our neighbors. So, so yes, we need far more face-to-face -face with masks, please, with masks. But as we get back together, we need more people demanding these things in our communities. Our communities deserve to be supported for our youth, for families, for, for all people. We deserve to have communities that are strong, uh, like the YMCA, the Friday Forum, with it, which has been supporting this kind of conversation and space uh, in many ways for many years. We need these things. We need these institutions to support intersubjectivity, coming together around shared ideas and understandings, which is what culture is based on. And it's our only hope. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Um, for those of you who are so interested, I know some people ask um, her book, Adolescence, Girlhood and Media Migration, U.S. Teens Use of Social Media to Negotiate Offline Struggles is available. So definitely check it out um, to see and read and hear more about the interviews that she did and the work that she's done. Um, and I know Amy mentioned she's working on her second book. So we'll definitely be on the lookout for that once it comes out in the future. Um, but yes, thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Um, thank you, Amy. Thank you to all the participants who were here. Um, today and also throughout this entire series. We really appreciate you all being here and continuing to support um, the amazing work of Friday Forum and have uh, a great conversation and discussion with all of the attendees and all of the uh, panelists who joined us this semester. Um, so yeah, thank you again one, once again. Um, the recordings of all the Friday Forums will be avail made available on our website soon. So definitely um, look, the, look out there if you want to see them and they're also available on our Facebook. So um, thank you again, everyone. And I hope you all have a good rest of your Friday, a good rest of your week. Bye.